I feel like it's been a while. It's been, I mean, it hasn't been, but it also has. It's been probably 20 days or so since we last recorded. Yeah, this this month is going by fast. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, sorry if it's uh, been a while since our last episode, but I'm Elijah Samuelson, and this is my good friend, Spencer Cook, and we're back with episode 9. It's almost the, the milestone, almost 10 now. Yeah, we're keeping we're we're keeping up with our with our quota of two a month so far. Even if this one might be a couple days late, um, yeah, we'll still have another one out in a in a week or two, hopefully yeah. before the end of the month. But yeah, um, so we're back with episode nine, and we're talking about the the idea of pl- building for a meta, and like what that means, and um, kind of how you can build for the the whole the whole meta of Commander. Yeah, something that a lot of players will uh, recommend is, you know, to play tech cards for your local meta or you build your decks to kind of not counter people's decks, but like just to adapt to what is needed in your local meta. And while that's obviously a good thing and you can do that, I like to, especially with um, Game Store is probably going to be opening up pretty soon, Eli, because, you know, just the the whole um, COVID stuff is it just seems like stuff's going to open pretty soon. Yeah, I, I even played in a Game Store about a month ago. So I think players are going to, you know, experience playing with new people or people outside of their their small playgroup that they might have. So I think it's a good idea to try to build your deck for what you expect people to play rather than just the what your three or four friends play. Yeah, because not everyone's so lucky as to have a regular, like, weekly playgroup of the same few people every week. And it's hard to, it, you know, sometimes it's hard to find a playgroup. Sometimes you just get to play, you know, at, a, at an LGS, so... Yeah, one of the one of the things that, you know, we think is really interesting is that, you know, EDH is is so diverse that like you can there, there's so much stuff that people's doing, but we think that you can kind of boil down what like the overall meta is into just a couple like five or seven or 10 things. Yeah, cuz you might play against like 20 different individual commanders in a night, but I think there's at least a few things that those decks will always have in common. Or for the most part, at least. Like, you can't say always in this. Like we said, it's so diverse. But, but yeah, there's there's some things that are almost constant in Commander. And you can definitely, like, play cards in your deck to not, not like, necessarily, like, like silver bullet them, but just to have, have play against them, right? To be able to kind of interact with your opponents or, you know, just, just have a good game against them. Yeah, I don't think anyone likes having just dead cards in their deck. Yeah, that's a problem. There, there's some cards that um, we don't... I mean, I don't often recommend you play, which are like, you know, cards that are like, destroy all green permanents. Well, I guess it's bounce all green permanents there on mm-hmm. their owner's hands. But like, um, unless you have like some sort of way to loot them away or whatever, where they're not as bad. But that's a little bit tangential. My, my point is, I think we're going to talk about cards today that are a little bit more ubiquitous that'll almost always find a place in every commander game. Yeah. Yeah. So you want to just kind of get started with... Um, with our with our our uh, common themes of EDH, yeah. Here. So we broke this down, and we thought about some things that happen in pretty much every game of Commander, even if it's not like every deck is doing all of these things. Like you're at least going to see one person taking advantage or capitalizing on on these themes. Mm-hmm. And the number one thing that is almost like unavoidable. I mean, there's maybe a fringe case where somebody has like a Planeswalker Commander, but creatures. You're going to see creatures in every game of commander right well yeah like you said except for the planeswalker commander uh situation every every commander deck has a commander But really is there ever going to be a game where four different people have spell-based planeswalker decks like (laughs) how do you even like yeah you're playing everyone's playing like will and rowan like or sahili or Doretti or something yeah but even even uh even like even sahili i think makes tokens or something or like they want to make tokens right yeah if you have seen that though i want to hear about that because that sounds like an interesting game yeah but but certainly one constant in commander is players be playing creatures and for good reason creatures are very good yeah, so even if if your only creature in your deck is is like your commander, like say you're playing like a Mizzix deck or something, uh, a card that uh, that we like a lot is something like a Fleshbag Marauder. And even in, against decks that don't play a lot of creatures, maybe that's even better against decks that don't play a lot of creatures because if everyone just runs out their commander on curve and then you run that out, you just three for one boop their commanders out. Yeah, and even if you go even further on that, cards like the the almost, not quite, but almost strictly better Fleshbag Marauder Plague Crafter where 
you know, even if they don't play creatures and they haven't played their commander yet and they're just trying to play it out on curve, they at least have to discard a card, right? Yeah. So. But, but even um the higher end of that, like being like a Wrath of God effect, some people might think, well, I don't want to play this in a meta or like if I don't have a regular pr- play group, if I don't know that people are always going to have like big wide boards of creatures, but four mana destroy three commanders. Yeah. That's still fine, right? Yeah, I think people sometimes get a bit obsessed with trying to get a... 15 for one with their with their Wrath of God effects. That's a bit hyperbolic. But there's nothing there's no shame in playing a Wrath of God to kill two or three creatures. That's just fine. It's just a still card advantage. Still card advantage still still does what you need to do in the game. Yeah, so uh, so a board wipe is always going to be great for that or just like spot removal too and there's even a a variety of like spot removal that hits like any kind of non land permanent. Yeah, so we were talking about how creatures are are so powerful but Moving on from that, you know, most commander decks will play some form of artifact ramp. Of course, the most common being Soul Ring or the Signets or something along those lines. And like you were saying, Eli, you know, we've got... There's 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 cards like Beast Within, which do kill creatures, but also kind of fit double duty and also being able to deal with the Soul Ring if you need to. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say that they think um, ramp is the most important thing in commander and the thing you really can't go without. So, yeah, ramp is a, a thing that I think will always be in a game. Like, whether it be through artifacts, lands, or, or mana dorks, mm-hmm. you can rarely ever go in a game and, and not see anybody accelerate their mana production. Yeah, I mean, like, individual players will sometimes forego ramp, but not, not a whole table, almost never. Mm-hmm. I would I would surmise less than 5% of games you don't see any ramp. Less I, than 2%, probably. I think you and I are probably, like, these, like, weird alien creatures in Commander that, like, sometimes don't play a lot of ramp or, like, next yeah, to none. Yeah, some, I mean, I, most often I do play ramp, but I do have a, a couple decks that play, you know, only a couple, like, two or three or four maybe pieces of ramp, when most decks probably play upwards of ten or more. Like, a, a small anecdote that I, I just think is so funny, so I submitted a deck to be played on Commander Replay, my Tajik Legion's Edge deck. And I don't play any artifact ramp in that deck. So some, so uh, PJ Commander Replay, he was playing that deck, and somebody attacked him with a thought of Adele, and they get to steal an artifact from the deck. And then, and then uh, he goes and looks at the deck list, and he's like, "What? There's not even a Soul Ring in here." <laughs> and the only thing they could steal was a Walking Bliss. That's my only artifact in that deck. And they just had to cast and, it and for they, zero. And they couldn't even. They didn't have the mana to play it for two two mana, so it was quite funny. It but, was a really good moment. He's like, "What are you crazy?" <laughs> <laughs> but got yeah, him. yeah. <laughs> Fish gonna come our way with the thought of Adele. It's got Death Touch and Menace. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm not throwing two things under the bus for that. Are there artifacts in this deck? Walking Ballista. I see a Walking Ballista. Fish probably thinks she's about to get something awesome artifact wise out of our deck, and I think there's like nothing in here. Just resort this again. It's not even a soul ring in the deck. Yeah, we're gonna have some work to do on the uh, the ramping after the game. But walking ballista, our lone artifact. <laughs> but you know, along those lines, those decks are decks that don't play soul ring are uncommon. It's not you know the most crazy thing in the world, but you know, ninety five plus ninety eight whatever percent of decks will have a soul ring or more in them. I think there's a lot of people that would be like, that is literally crazy. Why wouldn't you put soul ring in every deck? You have to. You know, maybe maybe you should, but I don't, we think there's more more to it than ramp. But the the common consensus is ramp is good and for good reason. Yeah. So you know, um, some ways. My favorite personal favorite card that I like to play to deal with um, things like ramp is Bane of Progress. This is one of my favorite cards. It's a six mana green creature that says when it enters the battlefield, it destroys all artifacts, all enchantments, and it gets a counter for each one of them. Mm-hmm. So the thing that, like, I, something that I like to do is I like to, like, kind of hedge my bets against Bane of Progress, where I, I kind of keep my, in a green deck, I kind of play more mana dorks or, or land ramp, and then so my Bane of Progress isn't really hurting me that much. But even in decks where you do play a lot of artifact ramp, I think Bane of Progress is just so good on the board um, when you play it, that you can kind of get yourself to, and it's going to be fine. Yeah, it's a it's an answer and a threat in itself. You know, specifically one thing I just want to mention about Bane of Progress is I have it in a couple decks, and you know, I I can count so many times in games where every turn, turn after another, I'm I'm thinking be, before my turn, what's the single best card I can draw right now? What's the single greatest thing I can get right now to answer whatever's in the field? And it's it's Bane of Progress nine times out of ten, honestly. 
that's a card that I, I feel like you'll be very happy playing it if you try it out. And when I'm playing my Gisela deck, I usually think, what's the worst thing that could happen right now? It's Bane of Progress. Yeah, so especially decks that aren't based in green kind of are very weak to a, great, a Bane of Progress, which is a great answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Similarly, I think, you know, maybe just to mention a couple, you have also, like, Austere Command and stuff as ways to do that, but we don't need to mention yeah, every so single... Yeah, so something like Austere Command or, like, a, a Cleansing Nova or Oblivion Stone will notably hit either the Dorks or the Rocks. Yeah, so that's kind of like, you know, those those first two themes of, of creatures and, and ramp. Like, you know, you can kind of you can kind of put cards in your deck that fill double duty and, and destroy They're both of them. very well-rounded. Yes, so that's one th- way that we suggest you kind of build for i mean these are the these are the obvious like things you know people are going to have creatures you know people are going to have artifacts so like no one's learning anything from this people we're just kind of reaffirming what you think yeah and and like land ramp there's there's less counterplay against that but um there's another common theme in commander it would be the tutors yeah and if you want to be prepared and like have a way to kind of fight back against that those same cards that work against tutors are going to be effective Against land ramp mm-hmm, for, for the sure. most part, except for the like explorations of the world. But besides, you know, the ones that's... yeah, there, there's some things, and I think uh, we're both of the opinion like y- you could say that mass land destruction is your answer to land ramp, but it, it really isn't great. Yeah, and I mean, and if you have tutor hosing cards like those, those kind of feel double duty. I'd rather play cards that feel double duty um, without even being like over costed for that. Mm-hmm. Like for example, you know, you and I both love an Aven Mind Sensor. It's a great card to kind of hit both of those axes axes oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah um i mean there's a couple other cards like stranglehold that you deal with tutors and stuff like that you know you've obviously got um uh opposition agent i believe yeah and that one's a bit of a no-no card a little bit but you know it's i i i'm, I'm not gonna I'm, I'm gonna go on a little bit of my tangent eli this is i'll keep this short but i i really think that tutors is something that kind of deserves to be um deserves to be kind of hosed deserves to have um, to like to be, you should, I think you should be punished, um, or at least be able to be punished for playing tutors. And I think opposition agent, while it is like really powerful and kind of a feel bad, I, I think it's, I don't think it's outrageous in the way that you know Hull Breacher is, right? I think it's a much more acceptable to play opposition agents than Hull Breacher, in my opinion. Yeah, and and the, a lot of that probably depends on like what kind of deck you're playing it into, because if you're playing uh, your opposition agent as just like a little like an extra tutor for you. For your combo deck or something that can feel like probably extra bad. That's a bit a, a bit more degenerate or a little bit not degenerate, but that's <laughs> whatever. And if you're just playing it to like host people's tutors, I think it's more fair. Like yeah, if you're playing against somebody and they they go to you have half of your combo in your hand, they go to demonic tutor and you're like, well, thank God I didn't draw my demonic tutor, but I drew opposition agent, so I'm, I'm good anyways. <laughs> well, yeah, but you know, moving on from that, um, we kind of it's a little bit similar, but um, another thing that players. Um, do be doing in commander you you know you and i everyone everyone included players would like to draw cards mm-hmm. so i mean even if it's not um drawing cards but players will will often play forms of card advantage in their deck um and you know having a way to curb uh that card advantage from opponents is is, is a very reasonable strategy to kind of um to kind of whittle away at your opponent's resources. Because some I like to play decks that kind of grind out resources. Not everyone likes those, but like you, have, you gotta stop the card draw if that's what you're trying to do. Yeah, I think the uh the majority of like more casual commander games are just like a resource accumulation game. And I think that's part of the reason that people have such a a negative a- outlook on things like infinite combos is because they change the uh the nature of that resource accumulation game because it, like people like to think like oh I have the most I have the most cards I have the most mana I have the most board presence I should be winning this game so the idea that somebody can just come and win on top of that can feel bad mm-hmm. and, th- and that's how I used to like when I was when I used to think feel that way and like kind of get upset when people would combo I was trying to like figure out why I felt that way and and yeah it's because it kind of changes the nature of that game. But yeah, Commander is mostly a, a resource accumulation game outside of maybe like CDH. Yeah, and but even then, like it, resources matter for sure, especially when you have a, a swath of free counter spells and free interaction, or just very efficient ones. Um, you'll run out of cards eventually if you keep using it. Um, but yeah, so you know, even these days, commanders have you know, there's a lot of commanders that they print that just have like that resource accumulation on them. So like 
not even just like cards in their deck, but like when you play commanders like Tatiova or the four color Omnath or Corvold. or Corvold or something, they just have they all have ways of you know whenever something happens, draw a card or draw this many cards. Yeah, there's this uh, at Wizards, they're really proud of this design for commander specific cards that just is whenever X draw a card. Yeah, because because that's literally like commander players. That's all they seem to want to do is just the, that's like that's like a fun cool design to them like it's just oh I, I do a thing that I was going to do anyways and I get to draw a card for it amazing I'm so happy <laughs> this is so cool I mean and I'm guilty I like drawing cards yeah, too Yeah like it, it, it's fun you know but it's like it's it feels a little bit yeah samey you know when they keep doing it and keep doing it So if you can pack um some ways to uh stop your opponents from drawing cards especially um, well, not especially, but there's 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 two kind of ways of card draw, and that's one at a time card draw and kind of um, drawing multiple cards at one time. So, and for the one at a time card draw, you know, it's a little bit harder for you to stop. But the the all at once card draw, you have a couple answers. Like you can do like Alms Collector or Eidolon of uh, Eidolon Eidolon Red- Rhetoric, Rhetoric, yeah, um, as ways to kind of stop, you know, limit them to one a turn or a couple a turn. Oh, it's Spirit of Land. Spirit, sorry, I don't know. Rule that's of Law. The, uh, rule that's of the Law Rule one. of Law. Forgive me, forgive me. Both enchantment uh, creatures from the same set. Yeah. Um, yeah, Spirit of the Labyrinth. But yeah, I've had a lot of success actually with um, something like Alms Collector, and it's it's not as oppressive as uh, Notion Thief. Yep. Or the the blue card, like Hull Narset Breacher. and stuff. Hull Breacher and stuff Narset, like that. Yeah. Because I don't I don't love saying like, oh, you don't like card draw, you should play Hull Breacher instead. <laughs> Alms Collector is is pretty. Fair, like it still sucks for if somebody goes to like use their um their greater good and sacrifice their eight seven yeah and they draw three or draw eight have to discard three and you flash an alms collector in response they draw one have to discard three it's pretty 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 funny but in response to like a blue sun zenith or something because because like you said I think in my experience especially against like green decks where they draw cards based off of like the greatest power of a creature like Rishkar's expertise is a super strong card yeah it's good to have something like an alms collector to fight against that. But the other like card draw engines, like whenever you do X draw a card, you can answer most of those with some form of spot removal. Yep. And um, similar to card draw engines, um, another way that a lot of players accumulate value or otherwise you know resource imbalance is by making use of their graveyard. This isn't something that you know commander players uh, are learning about just now. Like everybody, everybody and their mother is telling you to put more graveyard hate in your deck because obviously every everyone knows this. It's accepted. Um, we agree, certainly, but we also think, you know, there's some other things that people don't, um, some other things that we'll go into after talking about the graveyard that, you know, players maybe don't realize are, are actually, like, really prevalent. Yeah, because when people say you should be playing more graveyard hate, I think the assumption is maybe every once in a while you're going to play against a dedicated graveyard deck, and those decks are very strong, and you just need to have, like, a, to quote some people, they call it, like, a silver bullet card, like, something that's specifically good in a certain situation like a rest in peace or something right yeah and and you might think that those cards are just for like that match match up against like your marin deck or like your sir conrad deck but actually if if you think about it there's a lot more graveyard synergy going on in commander than you might realize yeah most like 99 well not 99 i would say about 90 percent. this is just off the top of my dome but 90 percent or so of decks will have some way of accruing value from their graveyard whether it be a flashback spell, you know, a regrowth effect like an Eternal Witness, or even just, um, you know, like a Goblin Welder or a Sun Titan or something like that. So a lot of decks have those things. I've seen a lot of decks recently where somebody's playing something like like Wonder or Anger, both yep. very good cards, mm-hmm. give you some keywords from your graveyard. Yeah, or even, um, what, I mean, not, I'm not going to mention all these random cards. Like I was going to talk about Quakebringer and how that card's kind of cool, but... Um, I think that does something with the, with the giant in the graveyard, or if it's in the graveyard or something. Oh yeah, if it's in your graveyard and you control a giant, you can deal it, two. It deals two on your upkeep. Yeah, yeah, stuff like that. There's li- weird little incidental. Yeah, or ca- Cavalier of Flame, where when it dies, it deals damage to each opponent where that lands in your graveyard or something. So yeah, a bunch of like you wouldn't even think of these cards when you think about graveyard hate, but they come up. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Yeah, that's another thing. Almost like the uh, it feels like with the uh, whenever X draw a card, they're they're just like. Okay, we got this good card already. What if it also did something when it dies, or like from your graveyard? Or yeah, I mean, and and 
again, with whenever X draw a card, you know, I, I like getting a value for my graveyard. It feels awesome. Yeah, if, if you like something, you want to do it twice. Yeah. Well, um, moving on from that, another thing that I think players are... I mean, they're aware that people do it, but they kind of don't... I think a lot of players kind of undervalue the ways you can stop these things, and that is big spells, like um, notably both big creature spells and big non-creature spells. Mm -hmm. Um, And so cards like, for the non-creature spells, cards like Bolas' Citadel or, you know, a big X spell like Villainous Wealth or even like, you know, a big extra turn spell like Expropriate. These are all really powerful things you can do in Commander and you have some pretty good avenues of dealing with these, honestly. Like, it might be a little bit of a no-no card, but I think Gaddic Teague... You know, just you just can't cast them now. It stops your opponents from cast or stops players from casting non-creature spells with CMC four or greater. Mm-hmm. And I think you know, um, in in a more a little bit more um, accepted uh, way of doing that is Redain, who makes uh, non-creature spells um, that you that your opponents cast for greater CMC cost two more. Mm-hmm. And my point in talking about this is that um, I think yeah, almost all commander decks are going to be playing some number of these cards. And it's not just that they're playing some number of them, it's like, they're the ways they win the game. Yeah. Is you resolve a big spell and you win with it. And we were talking the other day about how, like, Command Zone did their, uh, I think it was like a Mythbusters episode or something, talking about how the length of games has has shortened in the last few years, because, like, Commander is getting faster and everything. Yep. But I don't think there's going to be a version of the format, or, like, casual Commander at least within like the next decade where people just don't play six drops anymore well yeah so the thing that i think has been happening um people will correctly point out that 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 decks are getting lower cmc right and they're lowering their curves but that's only like an that's only an average of their curve i think players still tend to play those one or two maybe three six seven or eight cmc spells they just don't play five or six of them anymore they still play their big finishers that will win the game when they come out yeah, or the other end of that is just the ramp is getting better, and yeah. people are playing more of it. Like, I have my my Gisela deck is kind of a... It, I'd call it, like, a big stuff deck. Like, it's got very large spells in it, but I compensate for that by playing, I think, close to 20 ramp sources in that deck, and a lot of very good ones, too, like Mana Crypt and, like, Ancient Tomb. Yeah, um, and move it, like like, I know we, I didn't really touch on it, but, like, um... The the it's a little bit harder actually to deal with um, big creature spells, especially ones that generate value when they enter. Because obviously, cre- big creature spells that don't do anything right away, you can very efficiently remove them with like a one CMC Swords of Polish or something, and that's a great answer for like a mm-hmm. for like you know some some giant you know ten ten demon with flying or something. Yeah. But if the demon with flying comes into play and tutors a card, like it's you kind of need a counter spell or something similar to that to, to kind of beat that yeah so unfortunately like you mentioned Gaddock Teague and Redain and, and those are great but really the best thing you have to deal with a large spell is a counter spell yeah because like you said like you can use the swords on, on a creature and that's fine but like what's your best answer to expropriate or like a big torment of hailfire or villainous wealth mm-hmm. you really have to counter that in some way or prevent them from being able to cast it or for as much as they do yeah, yeah, if you have, like, some kind of hand disruption or yeah, something uh, like that, like discard effects, maybe, like, a sadistic hypnotist in black. Yeah, that being said, I think those those cards are probably, I mean, it's obviously, like, you know, Thought Seizes is, is not amazing in Commander because it targets one player instead of, you know, all of your opponents. But, you know, I think those types of effects are a bit underplayed in Commander, honestly. Like, I personally um, think that you know, including something like a Mind Twist in your deck, which is uh, it's a bit of an old card. It's black and an X uh, target player discards X cards at random, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's at random. Um, I think that that's a card that you can just kind of... You could, like, curve out and play that for five and kind of, like, shut someone down who needs to be shut down, kind of make them hellbent. Yeah, because if you're just always losing to somebody who just ramps, 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 and then plays their big thing, and you're not in blue, and you feel like you don't have a way to answer that, you you actually kind of do like I think even even in white and stuff like you you get like a, a lapse of certainty or you get what's that new card the uh, Paulo Vitor one? Paulo Vitor Domitorosa's uh, card the lead spellbinder yes yes that that while it doesn't it doesn't um, stop the thing and definitely you know if someone's ramping out to a nine drop expropriate and you look at their hand and make it cost two more you know they might 
take another two turns to cast it. It might buy you another turn or two. To to find a real answer or to kill them or something, right? Because yeah. everyone at the table will know that they have it now, and mm-hmm. it's coming down. So, yeah, I think, you know, hand hate is actually a bit underplayed in, in, in ways of dealing with some of these things that are kind of hard to deal with. Yeah. And the nice thing about uh, hand, uh, you know, hand hate, that sounds like such a weird way of saying it, but yeah, sure, um, is that, you know, it kind of does cover all of these axes that we're talking about, you know, because it, it, it is kind of ubiquitous in what it can deal with, right? It can deal with creatures, non-creatures, tutors, card draw, whatever, as long as they haven't played it yet. Yeah, yeah, so outside of a counter spell, something like hand, some kind of hand disruption, it could be very useful for you. Yeah, so just consider it more, maybe. Um... Coming but, off of that, yeah, yeah. The, the final theme. So this, I realize, could also kind of overlap with the idea of just like creatures being so prevalent in Commander. But creatures will in Commander will almost always be played because of some kind of activated or triggered ability, specifically like cards that might be your Commander. Yeah, and there's a lot of good ones that are your com- that can be your Commander or very popular Commanders that have both. You know, oftentimes both, but at least one of an activated or a triggered ability. Like, you know, Kenrith, Golos, Urza, Brea, Anji, all have really powerful abilities that, you know, it would be nice to be able to have some answers for, right? Yeah, you might have like a Linvala or like a Harsh Mentor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Suppression Field is a weird old enchantment. Makes your activated abilities cost two more, I think. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of weird ones, but like the the point that I'm that we're trying to make here is that some of these cards you would not think to play because they seem so silver bullet-y, like people will say. But what we're trying to say is that um, they actually, you know, affect more decks than you would imagine. Yeah, I bet you play a, a Torp Orb and there's going to be at least one person at the table who is very upset about it. There, You know, if, I think if a Torp Orb gets played, there's one person at the table that's very upset and two other players who are mildly or medium upset. Um, because they'll have something that gets hosed. Like we were talking about before, there was not a great answer to an Avenger of Zendikar, except for, you know, a Torpor Orb effect, right? Yeah. Uh, one that's really cool, too, is, like, Hushwing Griff, because it's got Flash, so it's like we were saying about, like, big spells and, like, your inability to counter them in certain colors. Like, maybe if you're worried about that big creature that has, like, some amazing ATB, like you said, Avenger of Zendikar, and there's... Yeah. Or uh, Magister Sphinx, that makes your life total 10, like, flashing that in, in response, like... It's good to feel like you can do something about that. For sure. Um, and if you're willing to just jump into this real quick right now, one card that um, one card that, that kind of spurred on the discussion, if you're willing to talk about that, Eli. Oh, yeah. Is uh, the card Containment Priest. This is what kind of uh, our inspiration for the show, because I think we had... Go- yeah, so go I, ahead, I was listening to an episode of the EDA Trek cast the other day, and I can't remember specifically what they were talking about, but... Dana mentioned something about how Containment Priest is kind of a silver bullet card against graveyard decks. And then I was thinking back to a couple of games that I played with it and just how good like Containment Priest was also for dealing with blink strategies. And how it was just kind of consistently good against, you know, in, in most games it was in, right? Yeah, like at its downside is it's worst case scenario, it's a two mana two two with flash. So it's like not that's not like amazing, but I just felt like I hadn't played a game where Containment Priest hadn't been at least somewhat useful against somebody. Yeah. So that was that's something that we just wanted to mention that I think Containment Priest specifically is a, you know, pretty powerful card that can kind of stop a lot of degeneracy um that, you know, is more common than you might think. Not a civil bullet we're calling it not a silver bullet card, just kind of a good um commander meta call. Yeah, so that was kind of the uh the impetus for this episode was to think of cards that you might think are very niche or very situational and think, well, maybe they're going to come up more often than I think, and maybe they cover more bases than I think. Like a Containment Priest kind of sister card that I also like is Hallowed Moonlight, and that one is a little, it's worded a little bit differently. It says just uh, any creature, not non-token creatures, so it can notably exile all the tokens somebody makes. So if somebody goes, like, tap their Krenko to make ten goblins, I could... Hello Moonlight, and then they make none. Or that Avenger of Zendikar we were just talking about earlier. Yeah, exactly. And then I also draw a card from that. So worst case scenario, you just cycle that card. Yeah, and it stops it for the rest of the turn as well. So if they were you know, trying to play through a co- play through it like the rest of their turn, if they were comboing off or something, they'd still have to deal with that effect, that lingering effect for the rest of the turn. Yeah, Spencer, um, you play Containment Priest in your Aurelia deck, right? Yep, and I used to play Hollowed Moonlight in my, um, oh god, the Rune, a Rune deck. Um and they were both pretty solid, honestly. So this is another kind of a little tangent, but 
You also play Eldrazi Displacer in that deck, right? Yes. Which can target your opponent's stuff. Yes. So that can just be a, a three mana. If you get the two of those, yeah. you can just pay three mana, exile your opponent's creatures. For good, yeah. So that's that's kind of a neat thing. Yeah, so there are, like, you can build these kind of situational cards to be even less situational, meaning that they fit in more, they, they, they work in more situations you can, than yeah, you Yeah, you think. can make them proactive in a way, yep. rather than just reactive. By adding a couple cards in your deck that kind of synergize with them in cool and cute ways yeah like something like uh like rest in peace just another example is there's there's this enchantment it's uh it's a blue card i can't remember its name but it makes it so if somebody wants to attack you they have to exile a card from their graveyard yeah so if you have that and rest in peace out i've just seen it in like some people's like zerdex they tutor out rest in peace they tutor out that Mm -hmm. and nobody can attack them then yeah it's kind of a neat interaction and while that you know obviously everybody knows that um graveyard hate is good um, if it wasn't if it wasn't the graveyard that we were talking about, and it was some other axis of of commander that isn't as common, you know, playing those two cards together would would make it a lot more reasonable for you to play that kind of silver bullety card because it's mm-hmm. not a silver bullet anymore. Now it's just synergy in your deck. Yeah, it's like it's almost like a a combo piece. Yeah, which is pretty cool. I like I like when I can find you know synergy and combo piece cards that will also incidentally you know stop things that I think you see in commander games. Yeah. So, talking about, like, things that cover multiple bases, we wanted to discuss a couple of overlaps of effects. And mm-hmm. the first thing I want to talk about is just how versatile a Wrath effect can be. Like, even outside of just creatures, like we mentioned uh, earlier, talking about creatures, how, like, an austere command will hit artifacts and enchantments, too. Yep. So, yeah, certainly Wraths are, like you said, Eli, the most versatile because there's so many different flavors of Wraths that you can find to be able to deal with, you know, most of what happens in Commander. Even the Wrath, there's even Wraths that do that kill all non permanents. There's even Wraths that, you know, that will make people discard their hands. Uh, well, not entirely, but there's some that, that kind of do double double purpose in that. They'll at least do something like that. Yeah, I think we're it's becoming more and more common, like, the more popular Commander gets, like, something like Cleansing Nova, they're just like, well, this destroys all creatures for five mana, but why not have it be or destroy all artifacts and enchantments? Yep, so you can kind of fit double duty in that when you need it. Because, you know, these are things that happen in Commander games. People play Enchantress decks, or even not Enchantress decks, but just have a couple problematic enchantments you need to deal with. So, yeah. Yeah, so if you have an effect that destroys all non-land permanents or just, like, some kind of permanent, it's... It's almost always going to come up against something, like especially those ones that give you some modality. Yeah, and additionally, you know, Wraths can also be like a really good tempo play because you know if you're able to deal with twenty or more CMC worth of um, permanence by only spending yourself anywhere between one and five or even eight CMC, you know, you're it's you are getting a big mana advantage. Yeah, because like we were saying about that big stuff, like yeah, it won't affect the uh, the non permanent spells. But if somebody's just, like, if in Commander all your opponents are laying down just, like, big threat up, like, somebody plays a Zendikar Resurgence, somebody plays their Grave Titan, the next person plays a Sunbird's Invocation, and you play your, your Hour of Revelation on the next turn, like your Onduin version, yep. then you're pretty well off. You just, like, you got up a lot of mana on them collectively. Yeah, and while, and you know, they're, and they're all um, kind of must-answer permanents, and, you know, sometimes it's a lot better for you to deal with them all at once, especially if they all, especially if your, other, your opponents, instead of, Instead, like, like you were said, Eli, the first play person plays a Sunbird's Invocation, and the second person, instead of dealing with the Sunbird's Invocation, develops their own threat. And then the third person, instead of dealing with any of the two previous threats, develops their own threat. Now you're the fourth person, you're like, oh man, this sucks, I can't deal with all these threats, unless you have a Wrath, then you can. Yeah, and those Wraths also are really good at stemming people's ramp. Like, I have a friend who has a Mono Green Omnath deck, and there's a few games that he's played where he gets off to a really fast start... But also misses like a few land drops early on. On but as long as you get to three mana, like if you play a turn one mana dork, turn two Omnath, then you just you can keep banking up your mana and just like have so much mana yep. off the back of Omnath Locus of Mana. But if you play a creature wrap and then destroy Omnath, destroy the mana dorks, then he's stuck on like three or four lands. Yeah, and I and I have a, a Cheville deck which kind of lead like kind of lends itself to play a lot of mana dorks and. I've done, you know, you, you do the thing where you curve out Mana Dork into Mana Dork and you play Grave Titan on turn, you know, three or four, and then you get board wiped, and then all of a sudden you have less mana than everyone else because you didn't play a, you know, you didn't play Artifact Ramp or Land Ramp, and now you don't have your Grave Titan either. So that happens. Yeah, it's it's part of the reason that I, I value, like, Land Tax so high above something like Soul Ring or Mana Crypt is 
Like if I have that turn where I early in the game where I dump out like my hand of mana rocks and I don't turn it into an early win and then I miss a couple land drops and somebody starts answering me, then I'm just so far behind. Like I think we played a game recently where I played turn two Shadrix off the back of a turn one Soul Ring and a Dark Ritual and then you destroyed my Soul Ring on like turn three or four. Yep. And then I, I missed a couple land drops and had to like keep trying to dig myself out of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I went I went mana dork into um, into what's the the dino. the dino that you can pay one second to blow up an artifact or enchantment. So I think I mm-hmm. destroyed it on turn three. Yeah. Um, or I think I went actually turn two rampant growth into turn three play it blow up a thing. Mm-hmm. But whatever, I digress on the specifics of that. It's not super important. But yeah, I think the point stands that that that's very good to play to play wraths. And then like we said earlier, um. Your tutor hate cards overlap with with some of your ramp hate, like stopping the the land ramp spells. Yeah, I think we we kind of mentioned that a lot, so we can kind of move past yeah. that a little bit. Yeah, and then um, there's there's just a lot of different effects that that are more versatile than than you might think. So yeah, like for example, there's a couple cards that are you know that are more versatile than you might think. Like today, like for example, like Tail's End is a card that I think is a little bit interesting. Like it's it's not it's kind of on the lower, um, you might think it's on the lower power level because it's really specific. It destroy it either counters it's two mana instant. It counters either a activated ability, triggered ability, or legendary um, spell. And you'd be like, oh, I, I, you know, you'd be like, okay, I, I, I get it. I want to counter someone's commander, right? But I think just having that versatility of being able to, you know, counter triggered ability, activated ability, or legendary spell, like that's going to happen in every game, no matter what, hundred percent. Yeah, because you wouldn't One of play uh, you wouldn't play bad counter spell. You probably don't play stifle, but you can always. You're probably going to want to counter somebody's commander at some point in the game. And if you don't, you can counter some like win the game. Uh, you know, some win the game triggered ability, right? Like you should definitely counter Golos, right? You should counter Golos, but like let's say for example they play a they play a what is it Besaju who shelters all and give their Golos uncounterable. You can at least counter his triggered ability to get a land. Oh yeah, or his activated ability to. Cast spells for free. You can counter all of it. Golos any is, of them. Golos is the poster child of like I think almost pretty much like all of these categories. Like <laughs> aside from maybe like graveyard stuff. Creature ramp. <laughs> yeah, he's a creature. Triggered ability. He's got an activated and a triggered ability. <laughs> he generates you card advantage. He gets you big spells cheat into play. So yeah, um, he, the only thing he doesn't care about is your graveyard. I suppose he could. Um, he could get you a land that has graveyard synergy. So there you go. That's probably a thing. <laughs> But he can if you if you if you think hard enough he can he can do any of these categories if you if you stretch it Swiss thin. Army Commander I guess yeah but do you want to mention any of the other cards I think we I think we mentioned like Stern Protector and Angel of Jubilation before yeah Stern Proctor the stops or Proctor e- sorry ETBs and uh yeah Elite Spellbinder maybe worth taking a look at um I think MDFCs are really they fit this um they fit this this theme like a glove in that they're kind of specific cards with broad applications because they always have that mode of land. Yeah, like, some of these cards you might think, I don't want to play them, even if they are broader than than I might think. Like, you might not want to play them because it still takes up a spell slot in your deck and you want to you want to do what you want to do. You want to do your theme. You want to, you know, play your synergies and stuff, you know, your theme of your deck, sure. But playing a modal, modal double face uh, land, land card is, it allows you to kind of fill both things you know you can do your theme and you can have some reactivity yeah so for example a card like a sajiri shelter you know we mentioned that um board wipes are some of the best uh you know uh, wrath effects board wipes are some of the best things you can do commander well moving on like the logical extreme of that or the logical extension of that is that we're gonna we're gonna tell you that oh if board wipes are so good you probably want to protect yourself from board wipes right yeah, and some board wipes, like damage based board wipes, are protected by MDFC cards like Sajiri Shelter, which can give protection from a, from a color to something. Yeah, and even just having that as a way to protect, like you you oftentimes won't want to play a spell like a Fake Shield that just one off like gives you your commander like protection from something to save yourself from a removal yep. spell. But Sajiri Shelter lets you get that, and then it's also just a land if you need a land. Yeah, and just to to move away from MDFCs just for a moment. Um, you know, you said that, you know, you don't want to play, you obviously don't want to play a Shajiri, or sorry, a Faith, a faith Shield. Mm-hmm. Um, you might think, okay, similarly, I might not want to play a, um, uh, what is it, Heroic Intervention. But the, like, but Heroic Intervention not only protects you from, from your opponent's board wipes, it also lets you do that, 
protect you from my own board wipe thing, where I play a heroic intervention, and then I play my board wipe, and all my guys live. Yeah, like, one of the strongest things that I can do in my mono-white Thalia deck is kind of manufacture my own one-sided board wipe through the use of, like, a selfless spirit and some or some other effect like that or like a mass blink spell to blink out my creatures then play a board wipe or an even mind sensor paired with a um the the thing that paths everything oh yeah winds of abandon winds of abandon and even mind sensor makes it so they can't get their you know exiles of opponents creatures yeah, if, they... if winds of abandon wasn't good enough try playing it with an even mind sensor or a lee and an arbiter it's awesome um but yeah i guess back to mdfc's just for a moment like I think that you know it's you're kind of hard like you're hard pressed to be super wrong playing a couple MDFCs in your deck. Honestly, like some of the best ones are you know Sajiri Shelter, Hagra Mauling, um, the one that makes the the plant is pretty solid. All of the ones that are enter untapped, the mythic ones that have big spells are awesome. Um, I guess you could play the you could even honestly play the one that deals one damage, the Lava Spike or not Lava Spike the. I don't know if there's actually a, the Lava Dart. That yeah, Lava one. Dart. There you go, that one. Um, yeah, and you know... The, some of the them, Regrowth, like, I probably should mention that. Just yeah, saying. the Regrowth, r- really good. Uh, obviously, you probably don't want to play like 10 of these because they mostly do enter the battlefield tapped and like you don't want to play like 10 tap lands in your deck probably. But those Mythic ones, yeah, you yeah. could probably... Play. I, I'm going to go on a limb. I'm going to say there's no downside to playing those. You could probably... Save for maybe like a five color deck, you might not want all five of them. Right, yeah, they're they're not like so efficient that like you you would want for them so much, but like they're just a land. But like a two color deck, like I don't, you could just play both of them; it's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, and and I mean, even the ones that like don't seem that good, like uh, what is it, uh, the treachery one, right? Yeah, song mad treachery. The it's an act of treason, but it's five mana. That, that like that seems pretty bad, and I and I'm one to admit that I wouldn't put an act, I don't even put you know act of treason in my deck, but you know. Sometimes that can win you a game if your opponent has like an Aurelia out and you take their Aurelia and you get your two combats or something like that. Yeah, like we were talking about big stuff, like that might be a way to take advantage of your opponents playing large creatures. Yeah, or you take um what's the uh uh what's his name? The eight mana eight eight demon that lets you sack a creature to tutor. Oh yeah, Razaketh. If you take a Razaketh, oh, you know, as long can you sacrifice itself? It unfortunately can't sacrifice yeah. itself. Yeah, so but... you will... Uh, well, unfortunately and fortunately, because they can't sacrifice it in response to you taking it. Yeah. So you take it, you know, you sack a couple dudes, get whatever your combo pieces or something, and win the game. You know, that's a, like... So it's not like it's super efficient, but, like, that's kind of the bonus you get from playing MDFCs, is that they're always a land, and then in the... In, like, the 10% or 15% of times where you don't play it as a land, they're kind of just free. Yeah, and, and of all of those... Probably one of the the best ones, like if we're going to say like board wipes are so important, yeah, would be Ondu Inversion. It's the eight mana destroy all non permanents, or it's a tap land that taps for a white. Mm-hmm. And this kind of um, jumps us into our um, our little like kind of discussion on on magic. Uh, so we, in the past, we've done these little breakdowns of some some Twitter controversies, but. I don't think we need to limit ourselves to Twitter. You know, I think this one is is about um, the MTG Gold MTG Goldfish podcast, right? They did an MDFC tier list. Yeah. So um, over the last couple months, MTG Goldfish, their crew from Commander Clash, they started doing a Commander Clash podcast, and I, I'd recommend it. I'd give it a listen. Uh, I like those guys, and I like to watch Commander Clash every once in a while. Um, but I saw that they did a tier list episode. And we did a tier list for and MDFC's first. Yeah. <laughs> they we stole in, it. We invented tier lists. Everyone knows that, right? Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, step off. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> but second, um, I was listening to it, and so I like getting other people's takes. But but Tomer had a particularly like had some hot takes on MDFCs, where he he kept saying throughout the episode that he evaluates them more as spells. And maybe maybe I didn't understand something about his reasoning. But as far as I understood it, he was like, if if I wouldn't play this spell, if it wasn't a land, I won't play the MDFC. So like he's like. I wouldn't play an 8-mana board wipe, so I'm not going to play this MDFC land. And he specifically was having a pretty reasonably sized, a pretty mid, mid, middle-sized disagreement with um, Seth, Richard, and Krim, who all said that Ondu Inversion was like very good in S-tier, and he put it down in B-tier. Yeah, made... they'd argued about this before on the podcast and on like Commander Clash, and I think so. Maybe they were partly trying to troll him, but I think they did make some really good points. So Yeah, they all put it at S-tier. And, and he gave it a B, B tier, which, like, really doesn't seem... If somebody said it was a B tier, I'd be like, you know, I sure, 
I agree doesn't with bother me. B tier, yeah. fine. But he had a lot of like really like weird arguments against it that I don't think we disagree with. Yeah, like first of all, like I said, him saying that he counts all the MDFCs as a spell. I think there's something kind of inherently flawed in counting them as a, a spell slot in your deck. Yeah. So one thing that I really like about um, MDFCs is that if you play like a you know three or four MDFCs, they can kind of be. Um, they, they can they can increase your range of keepable hands. I've talked about this before as one of the reasons that I love them a lot because you know you can't always keep a hand with you know two lands and some spells, um, but you can keep a hand with two lands and an MDFC oftentimes. Mm-hmm. And in addition to that, like um, there there's so specifically with counting um, onto inversion as a spell. Um, I've got some personal experience with this that I, an anecdote I can give. I have an Aurelia, the War Leader deck, which is a, you know, it's a, it's a deck that wants to curve out, play a bunch of non-land permanents. I think it has, I think it has somewhere around 30 or 40 creatures in it. Yeah, it's this, mostly creatures. I think it's 40 creatures and the rest of, and, and like, you know, I think there's like 10 or um, 12 non-land, non-permanent cards in it. So that are like instants and sorceries, right? Mm-hmm. And... So you would not think this is the kind of deck that wants to play Ondo Inversion, right? Because, like, oh, it blows up all my stuff. But additionally, this isn't the kind of deck that wants to play board wipes in general. Because if you're curving out, you know, you don't... you And you have a board wipe stuck in your hand, like, it's probably not going to be great. But that's the amazing thing about Ondo Inversion, is it's the board wipe you can play in the deck that doesn't want to play board wipes. That's why it's so good. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, one thing that, that Tomer keeps saying is... He, he keeps comparing Ondo Inversion to our Revelation, which is the... Six mana, uh, undaunted. Th- three and one, three and white, white, white. If you have, or if if your opponents have ten or more non-land permanents, uh, oh, you destroy un- all non-land permanents. Sorry, not undaunted. That's the number of opponents you have. Forgive me. And and obviously that card is amazing. I love that card. I it's love a great Re- card. Revelation. I would never put it in my Aurelia deck. It'd be terrible. Yeah, exactly. So um, so he keeps making that comparison because obviously if you're gonna compare one or the other, our Revelation is pretty much strictly better if you're just going for the spell side mm-hmm. but then yeah richard makes that point like you did he's like so do you want to put that in like your white weenie deck and uh and and tomer's like yeah and like richard's like no i put onto inversion yeah because in the late game or something sometime when you when you in your board is gone you can cast onto inversion and it won't hurt you that much and when your board is there you just play a land and it's mm-hmm. great yeah and like uh like you were saying about your relia deck i just remembered i also put Onto inversion in my Tajik deck, which is a very similar type of deck, and right. arguably much worse than at mana production than your Aurelia deck is. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it's eight mana doesn't bother me because, like, I usually hit all my land drops, accelerate my mana maybe a little bit. So if I draw down turn seven or eight, and I've just been board wiped, and somebody's ahead on board, I'm gonna cast it. Yeah, or I mean, especially in decks where you can hit all your land drops, like you kind of have the luxury of being able to if you need. The, the enters tapped um, clause. If most of your other lands enter untapped, and you ha- and you play enough card advantage where you can get your lands to your hand, you can kind of just fit it into a turn when you don't need all your mana. Mm-hmm. Like if you need the mana, you just play your your planes, and if you don't need your mana, you play your onto inversion. I have cast onto inversion. I, I don't think I've ever cast it in a uh, maybe once or twice in my Boros or like my Wano White decks, but I have cast it twice out of like the six games I played since I built my Shadrix deck. And it's been fine every time, and that's a deck that like commits to the board and like has a few big creatures. But sometimes you just really need a board wipe, like we were saying about like uh, how how much your opponents commit to the boards. The time I played it the first time in Shadrix, I had like Shadrix and a couple creatures, but all my opponents collectively had so much more than me. Yeah, like that that situation that I was that Eli and I were describing earlier, where your the first opponent plays a uh, Sunbird's Invocation, the second opponent plays a Grave Titan, the third opponent plays a you know an, an uh, some some other you know like a, a, a sure or like a or like a praetor or something right yeah not the green one because that but whatever um but and then and then you're just like I've got my commander out and then I'm like huh would I rather right now would I rather have my commander out and have my opponents have all those things or rather just wipe the board mm-hmm. and a, a lot of times you can just wipe the board and you'll be happier with that so yeah so what Tomer keeps saying is well you should you should play Hour of Revelation instead. And, and the rest of the cast keeps saying, well, that's not the comparison because your uh, Ondo Inversion doesn't replace your Hour Revelation. It replaces a land in your deck. Yeah. Because MDFCs, the lands, are lands. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I would 
personally, like if I'm playing, let's say I want to go for 38 lands in my deck, right? Let's say that's the number I'm trying to hit. Mm -hmm. And let's say I'm playing, I want to play three MDFCs. I might play like 39 lands with three MDFCs. Like not, I wouldn't, you know, maybe you might hedge your bets a little bit and be like, okay, three MDFCs, one more land, or, you know, maybe five MDFCs, two more lands or something like, but in general, you don't have to do that. That's just something I kind of like to do. Yeah. Typically what I do, because I'm not going to say that there isn't any kind of downside to like overloading your deck with MDFCs because yeah, tap lands do kind of suck. Mm -hmm. So usually what I do is I like playing more lands if I can and MDFCs are a great way to have an, a reason to do that. I just add like a sometimes upwards of 38 to 40 lands in my deck if I want to play like let's say three or four tap lands in that deck. Sure. And you know something that I want to talk about for a moment just while we're on MDFCs is that um the MDFCs, you know, especially the ones that are, are tap lands, you know, like I think I would a lot of times rather play an MDFC tap land than other like commander tap lands that people play, like for example, Life Lands or Guild Gates or Scry Lands. I think a lot of times I'd rather have the only one color of mana. Maybe and then, even like a Triome? Sure, I might rather play an Anduin version over like a Triome sometimes. Yeah. Because, like you said, people do play a certain amount of like just color fixing tap lands. Yeah. So, I don't know. So I, I I think and like I was saying, I think I might I might rather have, you know, if if you you, you want to keep your number of tap lands low in your deck, right? Let's say you only want to have like six or seven tap lands. I'm fine having four of those be MBFCs and the other four, are, you know, temples or triumphs or something. I'm fine with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that about um, wraps it up to, for this uh, conversation, right, Eli? Yeah, I think that that kind of sums everything up. Do we want to do a little of a recap or like what we what we what we think you should take out of this? Yeah. So the main takeaway is, um, I think, yeah, it's unfortunate if you don't have a regular play group, and if you have to play with strangers pretty often, and you play against a, a large variety of decks. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is a way that you can make your decks to be efficient and have very strong cards against pretty much every pod that you're going to play with. Yep, and even without lent, without having, like, one thing that I like to do sometimes is I like to play, you know, looting effects and silver bullet cards. But not all colors or even decks have access to looting effects. And when you don't want, when you don't decide to build your deck like that, like, you can just play these good kind of catch-all cards. Or even, you know, not catch-all cards, but catch many things cards. Yeah, so maybe next time you're playing, just, uh, just look around and see how many times, like, the, uh, the green white deck uses their graveyard in some way with like an eternal witness or the uh the spell slinger deck has a couple of key creatures that need to be removed and just like just evaluate like how common like these these things are yeah or maybe next time you know you're playing a game go to you know on turn six think about if i had an angel of jubilation in play would my opponents not be able to sacrifice that's what that one does right they can't sacrifice yep. would, would would them not being able to sacrifice their impertinence would, would they have a fetch line they can't crack would they have you know, some, some, an Ashon's altar they can't use because it comes up more than you think. So, yeah. So try to try out some of these cards. I think they're, they're pretty cool or don't. And just be aware of that other people might have them as well. Yeah. And let us know if, uh, if you think we missed anything that's like super common or prevalent or, or anything that you might have noticed or if there's anything you think that maybe we're wrong about, maybe really isn't that common. Yeah. Uh, we'd be interested to hear it because, yeah, we, we like hearing people's takes. EDH takes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's I think. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for listening. Yep. And we'll be back with another episode in like a week or two. Yep. Thanks, guys.